Hello, Mount Rudmore here, aka Nick, you just want to go by that. Uh, I am back to talk about BB26, uh, been an eventful couple days. Uh, we had an episode last night, and we had the veto meeting, uh, veto competition on Saturday, we had the veto meeting today. So, uh, first, I want to start with last night's episode. We got to see the wall in its entirety, because we didn't get to see it in its entirety. I mean, <laughs> I say saw it in its entirety, but we, we saw the end, finally. We'll never see this wall comp in its entirety. But they had some stuff to get to first, because there was just a blind side with Cedric leaving, and... The rest of the Pentagon being left shooketh by it. So let's just get to it. Uh, Quinn, he is in tears about Cedric leaving. And if I said it once, I said it 53 times. You shouldn't have nominated him. Cedric is not the comp beast that Tucker is. Cedric won one competition. I was saying Tucker won one competition and got cocky, but Tucker has been proving himself. Cedric won one competition and got too cocky. Because, as you may recall, he did the worst in the AI arena by a hefty margin. Like, Rabina was so close to McKenzie, it actually looked to me for a second like Rabina was going to win. But... Mackenzie and her long legs took the lead from her. I think Mackenzie's 6'2 and Ravina's like 4'10. But yeah. Like I said, Quinn just shouldn't have put him up. He shouldn't have taken the chance. Uh, t -Core said that she wouldn't have done it if those weren't the two nominees. If Mackenzie was on the block, t -Core was voting Mackenzie out, and probably a lot of people are voting Mackenzie out. Mackenzie might have left unanimously. I mean, it certainly would have been a blowout. I think best case scenario, Mackenzie left 7-2. to two. Couldn't even tell you who the two are. Just... I just think that's the best case scenario. Um, they show Brooklyn going around, talking to people, just trying to be like, we're keeping Cedric. We can't vote on Cedric, or we're screwed. t -Core tells Chelsea that she's not sure what to do. And Chelsea's like, how are you not sure? Chelsea was under the impression that t -Core was going to stay loyal to the Collective, because Chelsea was also under the impression that she was maintaining that Alliance relationship very well. So Cedric goes, the remnants of the Pentagon are furious at Kimo, t -Core, and Joseph. They reconfirm their loyalty to each other. Brooklyn's like, don't make a Texas mom mad. And it's like, okay, calm down. We get it. You're a mom. Y you know what I've noticed about Brooklyn? She doesn't talk about her kids. She talks about her being a mom. And I feel like that's kind of an important distinction there. Because <laughs> she's talking about herself more. <laughs> Uh, boy, I have been very brutal to uh to Brooklyn in my last couple streams. I mean, in the last one, I I talked about how people think she looks like Michael Jackson. So we get to the wall comp. It's called Firewall because it has a lot of fire emblems on it. <laughs> Fire emblem. Anyway, um, 
We see the times. Angela, of course, she gets the the classic fail edit. Like, she's in the diary room talking herself up, and then it cuts off immediately to her failing. And she falls off the wall at 3 minutes and 8 seconds. Next to go is Chemo. He falls at 4 minutes and 57 seconds. Neither of them lasted long enough to get sprayed by anything. Joseph is next, and as I suspected, he threw it. He falls at the 7.15 mark. Leah falls at 8.25. Chelsea at 8.30. Tikor makes it to 14 minutes and 47 seconds. Mackenzie and Brooklyn, this I thought was kind of interesting, because it said they both fell at exactly the 18 minute mark. First of all, I don't think they fell at the exact same second. They fell close to each other, but I don't think it was the exact same second. And even if it was, being right at the 18-minute mark exactly, that's a little uh, hard to believe. So, not too sure about that one. I think with them, the editor just said, screw it, it's roughly 18 minutes. Sorry, thought I was about to sneeze. A lot of pollen. I just, my allergies have been killing me the last couple days. Here it comes again. Be right back. I did not sneeze. It's just torturing me right now. So Rabina is the next one to fall. She lasts 22 minutes and 37 seconds. Which, under normal wall circumstances, isn't a very good time. But for this wall, they really increased the amount of stuff that they spray at everybody. Like, they, they set the hoses to civil rights. Because they are just getting blown away by whatever is coming out of those things. Cam falls 28 minutes and 56 seconds in. That leaves us with Tucker and Quinn. We finally get to see the deal. Tucker swears on his grandpa's grave. He won't put Quinn up if he drops. Quinn makes him the same deal. If you drop, I won't put you up. Quinn does not swear on any graves. So, not the exact same deal, but the same general idea. And Quinn falls 31 minutes and 45 seconds in, making this the shortest wall comp by over 10 minutes. And I thought this was going to last two and a half hours. Because I really thought that there were going to be a lot of people gunning for this one. But what I didn't account for was just how much they cranked up the difficulty of the wall. I mean, I think back to BB-23. That lasted like an hour and a half. It was... The last three were Derek X, Xavier, and Alyssa. And Derek X and Xavier in particular were hanging out there because they didn't want Alyssa to win. And Alyssa finally falls, and then Derek X and Xavier, they make a deal with each other. Derek X is like, come on, you already won. So, Xavier drops, Derek X wins. I think that one even could have gone longer than it did. Like, that was Xavier making the deal. Which is why it only lasted an hour and a half. So, yeah, this this competition was an hour shorter. So, that's, uh, that's something. Uh, Tucker says that Quinn is not the target. Because the rest of the Pentagon are better socially than him. And this is kind of what a lot of people have been suspecting. Quinn might just survive because of just how bad a player he is. <laughs> just, like, the amount of failure that had to pile up for Quinn 
to ruin that power he had is truly spectacular. Chelsea lies to Tucker, saying she thought she'd be the only one voting to keep Cedric. Even though Brooklyn had already said it was me, Chelsea, and Cam that voted to keep him. Tucker says at the end, Brooklyn is his target because she's the queen snake. And he calls her Medusa. And the episode ends as we all knew it would end. He nominates Quinn, Cam, and Brooklyn. Okay, the sneeze is coming back, possibly. Nope. Oh, God. Also, this room has no circulation. Like, I have a fan in here right now just to give me some air. It's just very stale air blowing in this room. And I have these windows open, but you see those curtains. They're pretty thick. You don't care about me. There's no one watching. So, yeah, like I said, you don't care about me. Um, so, on to the feeds. There's one thing I forgot to mention from my last feeds update. And it happened before I did my last stream, but I forgot to mention it. Um, forgot to mention that Brooklyn ratted Quinn out to Tucker about him saying that she's the target. Tucker says it was a test and Quinn failed and says he's the target. And then from there, we get to the veto competition. <laughs> now, it was the return of an old favorite. Hide and go veto. We haven't seen that since 2019, I believe. So, that was interesting to see again. And what's great about Hide and Go Veto is that there isn't really any one person that has an advantage. I mean, just whoever comes up with the best hiding spot. But that that could really go to anybody. So, people competing are Tucker, Quinn, Cam, Brooklyn, Joseph, and Mackenzie. And it really could have been any of them. But Tucker won again. <laughs> this is his sixth competition win, and it is week five. And he's won six very different competitions. It wasn't like Jag last year, where he was just he just got a bunch of physical comps and blew everybody out of the water. Or if it wasn't him, then his BFF Matt did it. He's just winning a wide array of competitions. And that's what makes him so great to watch. It's like he's earning his dominance. It doesn't feel like it's being handed to him. Like, he's winning competitions, except for the wall, because that's always, like, historically a physical endurance competition. But other than that, it's like he's really winning some diverse competitions. Now, we get a bit of a point of contention with Tucker in regards to Quinn. He thinks that Quinn messed with his clothes. The thing about hide and go veto, when we all know this, the house gets trashed. And Tucker is certain that Quinn messed with his clothes. And he, confront he confronted him about it. And told him, you better win the AI arena. Quinn denies it. And as it turns out, Brooklyn did it. And a bunch of people tell Tucker that they don't think it was Quinn, and Tucker admits that he was just running with it. Tucker is a showman, that's for sure. Brooklyn tells Chelsea she's going to talk to Tucker about using the veto on her and putting chemo up. Good luck with that. And they mention Tucker thinking Quinn messed with his clothes. And at this point, I'm starting to wonder, 
did Brooklyn do this to intentionally frame Quinn? Or did it just sort of work out that way? Because if she did it with the express purpose of framing Quinn, then I gotta give her some credit for that. I'm still not really sure if that was the plan. Maybe, um... The diary rooms on Wednesday during the competition might give us uh, a little more insight, but if she did do it to frame Quinn, then I'll I'll give credit where it's due. That would be pretty slick. Uh, Rabin and Tcor are talking later, and they think it was Brooklyn that messed with Tucker's clothes. Himo is uncomfortable with being teased as the Renom, because everyone outside 6th Avenue hates him. And part of it is because they just see him as an easy target, so they have no real incentive to say anything nice about him. It's like, if you can cut him down, then you feel less bad about getting rid of him. Tucker is annoyed that Quinn didn't honor the deal and says he's staying on the block. Joseph agrees, but says Brooklyn should go because Quinn's so bad at the game. Which is not to say Brooklyn is all that good at the game, but her social game is pretty good. I go and say Brooklyn is an all-around good player, but she's good in that one area, so I definitely understand why Joseph wants to keep her as the target. There is a 6th Avenue meeting minus Angela. Joseph says that Quinn would never put him and Tucker up. Maybe not you, Joseph, but Tucker, really? You really think he wouldn't? I think anybody would put Quinn up. I mean, put Tucker up at this point, because he's just... Or they'd at least backdoor him. It's because he's such a comp beast. Uh, Tikor and Kimo notice that Joseph is not saying Quinn wouldn't put the two of them up. But they all agree that Brooklyn is the target. And Tucker is coming back around on using the veto on Quinn. And putting up Chelsea in his place. Kimo is pushing McKenzie as the renom. Tucker still finds Chelsea and Brooklyn a dangerous duo, and he's not afraid of Mackenzie. He sees her as a follower to them. Uh, Kimo and Tcor later lament that no one's really listening to them, but at the end of the day, taking out Mackenzie is a good move for them, but it's not really a good move for Tucker, so, you know. Hopefully one of them can win an HOH and they can do what they want, and what they want would be putting McKenzie up. So, hopefully they can just win power soon, and then they can uh, they can make some, some calls. Kimo and T-Core tell Joseph they need to either keep Noms the same or put McKenzie up. Joseph is worried about Quinn leaving if he's up. And Joseph, at this point, is sensing that they're prioritizing Chelsea, which they are, which doesn't really make sense because they don't really have much of a game relationship with Chelsea. But they're just so committed to trying to protect her for some reason, even though Chelsea, after the flip, doesn't really care about them much anymore, particularly Chemo. Uh, rumors are starting to spread around the house that Joseph and Leah are becoming a duo, if not a full-blown showmance. So, the good spot Joseph has been slowly getting himself into, if he's seen as being in a showmance, that will go away pretty quick. Because his spot in the house right now is good, but it's not the most stable. It feels like at any moment it could deteriorate on him. And... 
a showmance or even a showmance perception would uh would definitely not be good for him. Tino tells Tucker again, he should put up Mackenzie. Tucker again still doesn't want to. Joseph talks to Tucker not long after this, saying that he doesn't like how Kimo and Tikor are trying to protect Chelsea. And yeah, it's at this point, Tikor and Kimo are at risk of making themselves look like they're in a final three with Chelsea. Like the harder they push to keep her, the worse it looks for them. And then, you know, if Sixth Avenue is the final six, Who's going to be 6th and 5th? T-Core and Chemo. And it's like, guys, don't overplay your hands. Angela can very easily be 6th place in this alliance. Or 5th, if someone manages to slay the dragon that is Tucker before then. But yeah, just... They turned on the collective because they didn't like that they were on the bottom of it. But now it's almost like they're putting in work to put themselves at the bottom of 6th Avenue. By just putting their games on the line for someone that they really don't have much of a relationship with. So it's like, just just cool it, guys. Just take it down a notch. Chelsea and Brooklyn still think Tucker won't use the veto, and Quinn won't leave. And it's like, we shall see. Wait, I feel like I might have meant to write Quinn will leave, but I'm not sure. I worded that weird. No, I'm not sure. I don't have the best memory. And I, I, the way I write on my phone, it sometimes I leave it open to interpretation, so I don't know. Angela tells Rabina she isn't sure about Joseph, due to him asking her who she thinks should leave. And it's like, at this point, Angela doesn't seem to want to work with anybody other than Tucker. She wants Tucker all to herself, and I've said this before, like, when she was trying to separate Tucker and Rabina. I feel like Angela is putting all her eggs in the Tucker basket. And let's say Tucker does not win a comp, or they get rid of the AI arena and they just traditionally backdoor him. And they take him out. What's Angela going to do at that point? Who is she going to go to? She should have some kind of backup. She's getting into the same territory that Brittany was putting herself in in BB24. Like, she knew before Michael left, she was probably going to still be here after him. And she just didn't really know how to prepare herself for a post-Michael game. And she would have followed him out the door if she didn't win the next veto. So I feel like Angela's falling into the same trap. If Tucker goes and Angela doesn't pivot to anybody else, then... She's that she's dead in the water. Like she's actually gotten into a decent spot for the first time since day three or four, probably. And she's already setting herself up for failure in the future. It's like you can't attach yourself to one person. It it doesn't work. You can have a final two with somebody, but you gotta have a couple more people. And you have a whole alliance now. Utilize them. Bond with them. Bond with Joseph. Even if you gotta fake it till you make it. Just do it. Uh, Joseph does a cam talk. Again, talking to the camera, not to cam. I can't wait till cam leaves so I don't have to keep quantifying this. He swears that he will stay loyal to his final two with Tucker. And he thinks he can beat Tucker in the end. You can always count 
on a Joseph Cam talk to remind you he's not as good as he thinks he is. Like I've been saying, he's good. But he thinks he's already a legend. And honestly, I feel like even if he goes on to win this whole game, I still don't think he's going to be a legend, at least not in, on the level of Dan Giesling or Dr. Will. Now, I'm sure he could probably, you know, finish ahead of Jackson Mickey and Andy Heron in the, uh, in the rankings, but he just needs to, he just needs to cool his jets sometimes. And listen, I get that he's feeling a little good about himself. He's one of only three people, sorry, he's one of only four people at this point that has not been nominated. Him, Chelsea, Hecor, and Leah. But don't go crazy. Joseph tells Kimo he has a crush on Leah. Again, Joseph. See why I'm saying you're not playing as great a game as you think you are? He shouldn't have told Kimo. This will probably spread. I mean, Kimo tells t -Core everything. So, yeah. Probably a mistake to tell him. Brooklyn and Chelsea campaign to Rabina together, which is probably a mistake. They want to work with her and Tucker to take out Angela. They still haven't noticed that Tucker and Angela are super tight. And Ravina rats them out, obviously. And Tucker further wants Chelsea on the block. Tucker and Quinn talk after Joseph tells Tucker again that Brooklyn was the one who messed with his clothes. Quinn admits he told Brooklyn he'd be a pawn. Tucker says she already told him that, as well as telling him about the final two that he had with her, which Brooklyn actually did not do. Joseph told him about that. Tucker tells him to keep his mouth shut because he's going to blow stuff up at the veto meeting. And he calls Brooklyn the Mother Snake. Kimo tells t -Core he doesn't like that Tucker is talking to too many people today. Kind of getting into Angela territory here with these two. t -Core suggests that he talk to Tucker about it. But the thing is, they don't talk to too many people other than each other. So him maintaining relationships with other people, that's kind of foreign to them. And Kimo talks to Tucker and he doesn't bring it up. Because that's just... That's the Timo way. Or Takimo, whatever you want to call them. I like Timo because it really kind of combines the names more, whereas the other one is just a T and then Kimo. It's just it's more it's more Kimo in that name. Timo, it's kind of split, slightly more split, I guess. T apostrophe Mo. How about that? Tucker tells Sixth Avenue he's gonna save Quinn. He's gonna blow everything up. He's going to reveal the Pentagon and the Collective, and he's going to put up Chelsea. Brooklyn is the main target, and Chelsea is the backup. Joseph says Cam is his biggest physical threat, but Tucker says, I can beat him. Oh, sorry. Time for my Tucker impression. I can beat him, you know. I've beat him in everything so far. I can beat him. I, I beat people in things. I'm good at beating people. That came out wrong, but you know I'm good at it. I'm from Boston. We're good at beating people up. I'm from near Boston. I have the right to say that. I've seen fights almost break out at stand-up comedy shows. All right? That's, that's what Boston is like. Joseph tells Angela he agrees that Chelsea should go over Cam. And he says, t didn't want Chelsea up at all. 
So this is Joseph, again, trying to put in some more work with Angela, who doesn't really like him that much, but he's trying. t is worried about Chelsea now being targeted, but she didn't speak up about this, which really is her biggest problem, consistently, and Kimo's biggest problem. They don't say things they need to say when they need to say them. At best, they say them way too late. So we get to Monday. It's a pretty calm day at first. Everyone's just chilling. Everyone's just getting ready. One way or another, everyone thinks they know what's about to happen. But not everybody is right. Because Tucker uses the veto on Quinn, and Chelsea is nominated in his place. Because Tucker just cannot stop choosing violence. And it's fantastic. <laughs> I just, I hope that they have decided to go back to the nine-person jury, and it starts here, because there is a decent chance, especially if this is the last week of um, the AI arena, there's a good chance that Tucker's gone the first chance they can get him. So, at least if he comes in 11th place, but it's a nine-person jury again, at least they'll have jury house content and... They brought back Hyde and Govito. Maybe they'll bring back the battle back. Who knows? They kind of had a battle back adjacent thing last season. I guess, if you want to call it that. That thing that stopped gameplay for a week. But, I feel like, for the last couple of years, they've kind of avoided having people just leave entirely and go to another mansion like, to the jury house, only to then bring them back, because for the last couple of years they've been worried about COVID. But I think maybe, possibly, they're like, we're willing to risk it again. So, if not this year, then I think we'll see the battle back again, maybe next year. And just so we're clear, COVID is not gone, okay? I have a cousin... He had it over the 4th of July weekend, all right? So, yeah, it's still there. It's still around. So, you know, get vaccinated. Keep an eye out for any warnings. And do what I do. If you're ever on the subway, wear a mask. And that's not even just to protect you from COVID, okay? Especially if you're on the Boston subway system. Anyway, Chelsea goes up. Tucker reminds Mackenzie to expect the unexpected, and Brooklyn is the target. Mackenzie says that the two of them and Rabina are screwed. Tucker says he's still the big target, but he doesn't seem too worried about that. I mean, he's been saying the whole time, if I go, I go, but I made it exciting. Like, T Tucker's here for vibes. Never forget, he is here for vibes. And he's here for content. Tucker says he's still the biggest target. Mackenzie thinks she is too. Because she's won so many competitions, even though it's two. Come to think of it, she's actually tied with Angela for the second most wins in the house. Tucker mentions that Brooklyn had an outburst at the veto meeting, and Chelsea backed her up. I can't wait to see this on Wednesday. Veto meetings this season, they are... They are something. They said that Joseph started the group, but Tucker doesn't care because they were the head of it, or at least Chelsea was. And also, Tucker tells Mackenzie about five points, and how Brooklyn wanted Mackenzie on the block. So yeah, uh, Brooklyn is not in a good spot right now. 
Uh, Brooklyn says that it's unfair that someone can say anything they want about someone in front of the whole house. And other assorted victim noises. It's like, Brooklyn, you were playing. You were saying stuff about a lot of people behind their back. And a lot of people hated Brooklyn for it, but you know what? I get it. It's the game. People talk behind each other's backs. That's the, the core of the game. But Brooklyn's just mad that everyone's better at it than her. Brooklyn is just not happy about her fall from grace. Chelsea also doesn't seem to be thrilled about it, but she's putting in the work to stay in people's good graces as best she can. Brooklyn just doesn't care. Like, it's what I was saying about Angela before. Angela is just not really playing the kind of game that anyone would vote for to win. I still don't think Angela's playing a game that will win, but... I think Brooklyn is playing a worse one at this point. Just in terms of how far she's fallen and how little work she's putting in to turn it around. Mackenzie tells Rabina that she would be gone if she didn't win the AI arena, which is accurate. Even Tikor and Kimo were like, we're still going to get rid of Mackenzie if she's on the block. So yeah, that part's accurate. But she thinks she would have left because she's close to Tucker. Not quite sure where this is coming from. Like, yeah, they're around each other sometimes. They've talked before, but I don't think Mackenzie has the kind of relationship with Tucker that Angela has, or Rabina has, or Joseph has. Even Tikor and Kimo at this point have better relationships with Tucker. Like, I would have at least put them ahead of her. So it's like, were they just hiding this Mackenzie-Tucker relationship on the feeds or something? So I just, I didn't even know where this was coming from. Chelsea tells Quinn and Tcor separately that she doesn't have any actual final twos. She's just working with people. She never locked in a final two with anybody. They both seem to believe this, and they both tell her that they will keep her no matter what. So, like I said, Chelsea putting in more work than Brooklyn to stay. And it's why I think Chelsea has a decent shot of survival. I'm not going to say she's definitely surviving, because that was a point last week when Cedric was in the best position to survive, and he didn't. So you never can tell how it's going to slip away. But even Tucker says Brooklyn is his target. Yes, if Brooklyn wins, there's a little bit of a gray area, but I'm leaning towards Chelsea will have the votes to stay over Cam. But if Brooklyn's on the block, then... She's going, I think, because she just isn't putting in much work at all to to stay. Brooklyn tells Mackenzie and Rabina that Joseph didn't want her in the collective. Mackenzie says that she shouldn't accept an alliance where she wasn't at the original meeting. Brooklyn says it was the original meeting. Uh... I once thought she was good at this. But that is a very bad read. Now, Quinn, finally, at long last, a week and a half past when he should have hurt. Quinn tells Leah that he's heard she doesn't like him. And in tears, she says, that's not true. I know it seems a little hypocritical to complain about somebody lying, but this lie has an extra layer of ick for me, because Leah's dislike of Quinn, it really seemed to kind of go beyond game. Like, she would leave the room when he'd come in. And now she's 
like that's not true and it's like you know i get it you don't want to say that to his face but at the same time quinn is eventually going to watch this back and he's gonna see just how much you didn't like him like he's going to binge Terran after this is all over and he's gonna find out and uh yeah Quinn and Leah might have a rather awkward conversation at some point. All right, so that is all my notes. Now I am going to check online to see there's a, any more updates. Today's been a pretty solid update day. Like, since this went down, the feeds have been feeding. So, I think, uh, I think I might have some more stuff to talk about this time. All right, nothing on my uh my main timeline. <laughs> I did see someone uh point out that this all started because Chemo had a crush on Tucker, and yeah. Yeah, nothing on my main timeline. Gonna head over to BB Updates. Oh, we got some. Couple. Oh. I wasn't going to mention this before, but I think I have to now. Mackenzie is really on a, a, a Bible trend today. She's mentioned reading it a couple times. She says to Leah, I was literally reading in my Bible about liars. I was like, I feel a shift towards me that I don't think is because they want to be with me. I was like, what needs to be revealed, let it be revealed. I could feel that something was going to go down today. Yeah, it's easy to say that after something has gone down. Leah to MJ. It wasn't a house vote week one. It was an alliance that we didn't know about, plus a couple of others that wanted Matt out. I have hiccups. Sorry. Leah says to MJ, it bothers me, the lies to cover themselves. When I was outside today, I said that in front of Chelsea. And Mackenzie to Leah. It was Chemo, t -Core, Joseph, Quinn, and Rabina in the HOH room. I look at Tucker and say, I don't know why they feel comfortable in your room, but if anything is going on and you want to tell me, let me know. I know that's something, because they are not going to lock the door. He goes, I have no idea. I said, you better not, because I am very aware of it and going to keep my eyes on it now. Okay, so. Mackenzie may be on. To uh, part of Sixth Avenue, but minus Angela and with Quinn instead. But Quinn might actually be loyal to this alliance now that Tucker has actually saved him. I still think Quinn will try to take out Tucker if he can, because I think a lot of people will. But if 
this alliance stays in power and stays loyal to each other, which I think would probably only happen if Angela or Joseph wins HOH. I think Gwen would vote how they wanted him to vote, because I think he's become a number for them. Alright, I'll check the hashtag. Oh, apparently Angela might have been smiling and giggling at the uh, at the veto meeting, and someone has suggested that might set Brooklyn off, and that would be something a uh, a married mom off. Like they were tight with each other, but I still remember Brooklyn from the blow up, from the Angela Matt blow up. I remember Brooklyn very specifically because she was in the bathroom in just a towel. And I remember her mouthing the words, she's got to go. Or she's going up. Something like that. Something that indicated that she has got to get Angela out of here. And she's been on that ever since. Let me try Hamster Watch before I call it a night. Just saying that most of them have finally wound down, but Leah and Mackenzie are still going. That's about all I got. I'm going to call it here. There's no one watching this on Twitch, but if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching. You can follow me on Twitch. Well, you can follow me on Twitch at Mount Rudmore. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Nick Grimes YT. I have links to my YouTube channel and my Twitch channel there. Uh, I post all my streams on YouTube so you can catch up if you want, which I hope you do. Uh, and just follow me on Twitter to get my thoughts on Big Brother stuff as it happens. I'm a uh, I'm a very frequent tweeter about Big Brother, and it's still tweeting, and it's still Twitter. You hear me? Apartheid Clyde. Okay, that'll do it for this stream. I will see you next time. Peace out.